It's the Farmer to Farmer podcast, episode 64, and this is your host, Chris Blanchard. My guest today, Laura Frerichs, owns and operates Loon Organics with her husband, Adam Kulop, in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Loon Organics grosses $200,000 on eight acres of produce and 10,000 square feet of high tunnels, providing for a CSA, local retailers, farm-to-table restaurants, and the Mill City Farmer's Market in Minneapolis. Six employees keep the farm humming and beautiful. Laura and Adam started farming at their current location in 2009 after several years of incubating at Gardens of Egan in Farmington, Minnesota, and several years before that of working on farms of different scales around the country and around the world. Laura shares her experience as an incubatee, including the investment and business growth strategies that Loon Organics used to provide a running start once they landed on their own place. Laura also shares her experience farming with children and how that prompted her and Adam to invest in improving their quality of life by improving their utilization of employees. We dig into some of the practical aspects of employee delegation at all levels, and we also talk about marketing, electric tractors, post-harvest handling, and growing broccoli all year long. I had a lot of fun doing this interview with Laura. I hope you enjoy the episode as much as I enjoyed making it for you. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, founded by organic crop growing professionals committed to meeting the need for high quality compost and compost based living soil mixes for certified organic plant production. VermontCompost.com. This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are versatile, maneuverable in tight spaces, lightweight for less compaction, and easy to maintain and repair on the farm. Gear-driven and built to last for decades of dependable service. BCSamerica.com. Laura Frerichs, welcome to the Farmer to Farmer podcast. Thank you, Chris. I'm so honored to be on. Oh, I'm tickled that you're here. And it's especially great to have you here on your birthday, Laura. I, I'd sing for you, but then I think everybody would just tune out <laughs> permanently. No problem. Yeah, no, it's a it's a really fun thing to do on my birthday morning to take some time off of planting and, and to talk about our farm. Well, I mean, a late April birthday, Laura, that doesn't seem like the best planning to me for a market farmer in the upper Midwest. <laughs> yeah. At this point in time, um, with a late April birthday, the farm is usually top priority. So I'm always surprised like, oh, it's my birthday today. Oh, OK, great. We get to eat cake while we work. <laughs> 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 Sounds good to me. <laughs> All right. So could you start off by telling us about about your history with the farm? Because I think that's really interesting how you and Adam got started in farming. Sure. So um, I am farming with my now husband, Adam Cullop, and we started, um, goodness, in 2003 uh, was kind of our first um, exposure to organic farming. And I had graduated from Grinnell College in Iowa with an anthropology degree in 2002 and was interested in agriculture um, and local food, kind of the movement was just getting started and awareness was growing at that time. And and I just thought it was really cool, you know, at that, that point in time being in my early 20s. Um, so I was working in the Twin Cities after college and um, was working some desk jobs at nonprofits and and absolutely hated it, hated being inside, hated being at a computer, um, and wanted to get outside for the summer. So I was lucky to find a position with Gardens of Egan in Farmington, Minnesota. And at that time it was being run by Martin and Natina Diffley. And I got, a uh, an apprenticeship there for the summer. Um, they took me on without any experience, which I was quite grateful for. And I met Adam around that time. He was in graduate school at the University of Minnesota um, in public health. Uh, And we started dating and he would come out and visit me at Gardens of Vegan. And we both were just really blown away at the size and scale of their farm and uh, how well run it was, how much food they were producing. Um, we just hadn't been exposed to that level of food production and vegetable production before. Um, so it was quite inspiring. And I think it'd be worth stopping there a moment and just saying like how big Gardens of Vegan is, because for many, many years, Gardens of Vegan was a real major player in the Twin Cities local food scene as just simply by the volume of produce that they were pumping out. Yeah. Um, and I... I believe that when I was there, there was around 60 to 80 acres in actual 
vegetable production. And it was cool to, you know, I would go into the Twin Cities for the, to spend my weekends and go and shop at the local food co-ops, which there are so many, um, you know, scattered throughout the Twin Cities. And they were a huge farm and their produce was in all of the co-ops. Um, and that was a really cool connection to make, you know, to really see how many people um, were shopping and buying and eating that produce um, on a pretty large wholesale um, scale. Uh, so it was a great place to start. Um, and what is ironic about it is that uh, then just a couple years later, we ended back up at Gardens of Egan and renting land from them. And they gave us gave us our start there and gave us an, an incubator situation. So um, we ended up working on a number of organic vegetable farms in Minnesota. Um, the, the following summer, we actually went south for the winter. I worked on an organic date farm in Southern California for one winter. And then we went to uh, Brazil and worked on a biodynamic farm there for a couple of months over the winter before we started our business in 2005. Um, so we were really grateful. We were kind of at that point, you know, being 25 and 26 years old, really interested in farming, um, had worked on five different farms at that point, but could not at all uh, afford to buy our own farm. And we also, thank goodness, had a little bit of knowledge to say we're not ready to buy a farm and farm on our own. We're, we're just, that wouldn't be successful. Um, so Atina and Martin were really gracious in saying, you know what, we have a field, a small field that we're not using. We could totally set it up for you. You can borrow and use some of our infrastructure and equipment. Um, there was a house uh, that they owned on the other side of the farm, very close to the field that they had um, for us to rent. And so we had housing. We built a little pack shed there. We set up a little cooler um, and, you know, we were good to go. Uh, so that opportunity, you know, really allowed us to say, do we want to do this? You know, do we, do we want to farm? Because we can easily walk away after a year and not be out, you know, not have a mortgage, um, not have a lot of, of stress about making that decision. Um, and, and that was pretty invaluable for us. And, and that year, um, really solidified that that we loved what we were doing um, and we wanted to continue farming, you know, in some capacity um, and just kind of grow and build our business. And I, I remember actually visiting Gardens of Egan at that time. And, and I don't think that I had met you at that point, but I saw your, your setup there. Atina toured me through there and, and you guys also had the opportunity then in those years that you were farming at GOE, you were building your customer base and also investing in equipment and stuff when you didn't have the overhead of having to try to run your whole operation on land that, that you owned or with, and, or frankly, with equipment that you owned necessarily. Exactly. And I think that is one of the huge advantages of starting as an incubator farm, uh, you know, we we were working both for Gardens of Egan um, part time and then we also had off farm jobs. So we were really supporting ourselves with income off of our farm. And and so what we did was all of our farm profits, we kind of plowed back into the business and bought um you know, basically machinery and equipment and supplies and all of those things that you need to get started. And after we had been there for a couple of years, we said, you know, we think we're going to buy a farm eventually, you know, in the next few years, that's really our hope and our dream. Um, so how can we best prepare ourselves for that situation when we know in a few years we will have a mortgage payment um, and we would like to be supporting ourselves from the farm. Um, and we will have 40 acres or 20 acres of land to manage. You know, what what do we need to um, get to the farm and be really well set up for that? Um, so it was it was funny because well, and then of course working at Gardens of Vegan, I mean they they had a very extensive um, line of machinery and equipment. And Adam was 
was doing some equipment operation there. So he was very used to kind of having like a tractor for every single job on the farm. Um, and that was just like the mindset that we had. So I think our second year we were farming an acre and a half, um, and we had three tractors. Um, so we had that tractor for each, you know, half acre or something. Um, and we had an 80 horsepower tractor. Uh, but it really was with an eye of looking towards the future and, and setting ourselves up for that. Um, and, you know, we, our intention was to have, a. a a smaller scale farm, something that we could support our family on, but we didn't want to be a gardens of vegan. Um, we loved working there, but we just didn't want that big of a farm. You know, frankly, we couldn't have been able to buy that much land and, um, we didn't have that much experience to feel confident running that farm and, and felt like there was a lot of risk involved. But being on that farm and just seeing how they managed um, that large of a of a business um, gave us a lot of lessons for how we can apply that to even a very small scale. Um, And I should say of the farms that we worked on before we started our own business, we worked on a really uh, diverse group of farms. We worked on a really um, a smaller scale CSA that was about five acres. Um, we worked for more of a medium sized uh, farm that was doing kind of like half wholesale, half direct market. So doing restaurant sales and um, co-op sales, but also doing a CSA. And then we worked for Gardens of Vegan, which was, you know, a large wholesale operation. So um, that wasn't necessarily intentional that we, that we were getting all of that experience, but in hindsight, I am so grateful that we had that opportunity to see the whole range of scales of farms, um, because we just were able to kind of take what worked for all of these different scales and then apply it, you know, for, for our operation. I think it's so great that you guys did that, even if it wasn't intentional. I think, you know, if you're, if you are a beginning farmer and have the opportunity to work on farms, getting that that diverse array of farms, I mean, both markets and scales and approaches, it's just so important, I think, because sooner or later you decide that you're going to model yourself off of something. And and having having some a lot of different models to choose from, I think, can help you better find something that actually is going to fit your personality. Exactly. Yeah. And and all of those farms you know, I think it is, it's, it, it is very much based on your personality as a farmer and, and what works for you and what you prefer doing. Um, so, you know, we, we knew that we wanted to have a pretty close relationship with our customers. So direct marketing was a really good fit for us. Um, and, you know, we saw that from different farms, especially the CSA farm that we worked on. Um, we just really loved that model of, of connecting really closely and building those relationships with your customers. And interestingly, Gardens Vegan didn't have a CSA. So that was, I mean, again, something where you guys were incubating on a farm that really didn't turn out to be the model when you stepped out and started your own operation. True. Yeah. Um, they did have a roadside stand. Um, and I worked there for a number of years, um, as an employee. So I did have a little bit of that like direct to consumer contact, but, um, yeah, we weren't exposed to the CSA model at gardens of vegan. We worked at another CSA farm, um, kind of before we started incubating there, um, and, and were exposed, exposed to that type of marketing and, and, um, that model of agriculture. How long did you guys incubate at Gardens of Vegan before you stepped out and got your own piece of land? We were there for four seasons. And after our second season there, we got pretty serious about thinking about our transition strategy and finding a farm to buy. And we started looking uh, at that point for, for land and started looking at farms. And we looked for about two years. We were hoping to stay in that area. So we were pretty close to Northfield, Minnesota, and that was our community. They had a food co-op there that I worked at. Uh, we had a lot of friends and there's a great community of farmers there. 
and Northfield and and then Farmington, where Gardens of Egan is was located, that's all kind of in, you know, half hour to an hour south of the Twin Cities, right? Exactly. Yeah. So from Gardens of Egan, we did a, and we still do a Minneapolis farmers market that's in downtown Minneapolis on Saturday mornings, the Mel City Farmers Market. And we could get there in half an hour from Gardens of Egan. Um so so it's about, yeah, half an hour to, to 45 minutes. So you were trying to stay in that area and, and looking for land. Yep. Looking for land and just really struggling, um, struggling to find anything that would be appropriate for what we were interested in doing. Everything was really expensive. We were caught between development pressure from the Twin Cities metro area and development pre- pressure for Rochester, Minnesota. Um, we were kind of looking at like the Highway 52 corridor. So between those metro areas and everything was so expensive or it was not not flat, <laughs> not suitable for, for vegetables. Uh, so we, we started to expand our search area. And I have to say one of the major criteria that we ended up kind of looking at was we just needed to be within 90 minutes of the Twin Cities metro area. That was our market. That's where our customers were. We had built our business there. um, And we felt like there was a lot of opportunity, market opportunity there. And we needed to be within 90 minutes of that. So then we just kind of started expanding a radius, drew a radius on the map around the Twin Cities and started looking in all of those counties nearby. Um, We also wanted really good soil. So, um, we, we, we wanted to stay, we both are from Minnesota. We wanted to stay in Minnesota and we were hoping we could find, um, you know, either a farm kind of South of the cities or West of the cities with really nice, um, prairie soil. So 2008 in the early summer, late spring, I think around June, we were just looking on the MLS online real estate listings and a 40 acre farm popped up in Hutchinson, Minnesota, which is about 70 miles west of, of the twin cities of Minneapolis. And, um, it was just within our price range. It was actually certified organic already, which we weren't even expecting to find a certified organic farm at all. Um, we were expecting that we'd have to transition land and, um, it had been operating as a very, uh, a pretty small CSA, but as a vegetable farm. Um, so we immediately came out and, and saw the farm. And I think within a week we made an offer. Um, and, uh, the, the great thing for us is that was in June. Um, and then we were able to finish out our season and close on the farm at the end of the end of the season. And we had to, um, really spend most of the summer securing financing through the USDA, um, through the Farm Service Agency to get a beginning farmer loan. No other bank wanted to give us credit at that point in time. We were just totally new and unestablished and didn't have enough of a credit history. Uh, so um, the FSA loans are awesome, but they do take a lot of time. Um, a lot of paperwork, so much paperwork. Yeah. So much paperwork and just, you know, this, the, everything has to be reviewed. I mean, it's, it's a bureaucratic process. Um, and it took some time. Um, although I will say I'm so grateful that, that they are available because we wouldn't have been able to buy this farm otherwise. Um, so we were able to kind of get the get everything, you know, in order over those, um, four or five months before we closed and and moved to the farm in October of 2008. And we have been there, been here ever since. Um, this is our eighth season here. Um, I, I, I'm losing track. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) It's been a while. (laughs) Um, but, but really our goal was to, uh, move on to this farm and for Adam and I to be able to quit our off farm jobs and become full time farmers. And we did that in 2009, our first season here by the skin of our teeth. I mean, just barely did we do that, but we did. Um, and that was, um, that was one of our goals and we haven't looked back since then. It's, it's gotten way better. (laughs) 
we're not we're not doing it by the skin of our teeth anymore. We're actually um, making a living um, pretty much solely from the farm, um, from farm income, and and it has worked really well for us. That's really great, and and I. It sounds like the incubator program was probably a really important part of you guys being able to do that so quickly. Exactly. Um, yeah, I, I think that that was one of the, you know, most crucial parts of our success in terms of being able to start a business virtually without anything, um, with very, we had about $5,000 in personal savings that we used to kind of get us going and to finance, um, our first, you know, startup year. Um, but other than that, you know, a couple years of experience, um, and $5,000 to being able to buy, um, you know, a 40 acre farm four years later and be farming full time, that incubator, it just kind of launched us. Um, so I think it's such a wonderful model for getting, um, you know, especially young people, um, and, but any new farmers to get them started. And, and, you know, the thing that I didn't mention is, uh, that, that I think the most successful incubators have a mentorship component involved. So we were on Gardens of Vegan. We had access to Martin and Atina, um, to all of their employees who also had knowledge and sometimes even would help us out with, with labor. Um, Linda came on in 2008, um, Linda Holly. And so we had some really incredible experienced farmers, um, to, to bounce ideas off and they would drive by our fields and say, Ooh, looks like you need to get out the cultivator. And, um, you know, just give us a lot of feedback and tips, um, to help us in those really crucial first years. Cause I mean, looking back on it, you know, we didn't know what we were doing. Like, you don't know what you don't know. <laughs> right. That's such an important thing. <laughs> yeah. It, in it's, um, but we have to have a way for beginning farmers to get started and to, to make those mistakes, but not have it cost them their farm or their livelihood. Um, and honestly, just, you know, for us not to have that financial component involved, it made it a lot less stressful for us. So if we made a mistake, um, you know, whatever we, we didn't, Oh, for example, we planted eggplant our first year and we, we side dressed it with, um, sustain and it had been in a really fertile part of the field. We didn't get any eggplant. Um, but our eggplants were, plants were like five feet tall. Um, right. <laughs> but there was no, there was no fruit. <laughs> um, we over fertilized it. So, um, you know, but at that point in time, like we were bummed about it, but it didn't, it didn't matter. You know, um, we actually didn't even do a CSA our first season. So we didn't have that stressor as well, which I'm really grateful that we didn't do that, um, right off the bat. Um, it was just, you know, Oh, we don't have eggplant for our farmer's market. Well, that's okay. You know, people aren't that jazzed about eggplant anyways. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think the other thing that you have, in addition to that mentorship component, when you're, when you're working alongside an experienced farm is you've got a picture of what success looks like. I mean, I would imagine that when Martin and Atina drove by your fields and said, Hey, that needs to be weeded. You're looking out at their fields and going, well, there's a real difference here. Ours have weeds. There's don't. Yep. I know what I need to do rather than being in a situation where you just say, well, this is just how it is. Exactly. And, um, not only that, but we were just, you learn so much just by paying attention then. Um, you know, it's, it's one thing when you're working on a farm and you're trying to pay attention, but when we were doing it for ourselves, by golly, we would notice when they were in their fields for the first time and planting. And we would say, Ooh, we got to get out there. Like, let's get organized. You know, um, we would notice when they were putting in their tomatoes and their peppers. And so all of those really little lessons and, and kind of, um, you know, there's all those decisions that you have to make on the fly that vary from year to year. And you have these short windows of when you can get in. So if we kind of notice like, Ooh, rain's coming and they're cultivating, this is, you know, it was like, uh, just a kind of a 
learning by osmosis um, uh, since they were farming all around us. Um, but yeah, definitely that first year, um, the first year that we farmed and incubated there, uh, Adam and I really learned the importance of systems. So, you know, Gardens of Vegan was set up very much on a, on a row crop basis. Everything was on 36 inch centers and, you know, very clean and well, well tended and taken care of. And we kind of planted, you know, some things over on this side of the field, some things over on the other side of the field. And then we'd plant some salad mix in the middle and we got into the season. We're kind of like, we have absolute, where's our system? Like, what are we, what, what are we doing? <laughs> um, so I think that was kind of in heightened and, and we, we were able to look at that and realize that, because we were surrounded um, by by their fields and and they had a system on their farm and that helped us get our systems in place as well. So you guys got out on on your own farm working full time then in two thousand nine. What does your farm look like now and and how long did it take you to get there? Sure. So um, the majority of our produce is direct marketed. Um, about 60% of our sales uh, are from our CSA program. And that is about 175 boxes that we pack each week during the season. We have an 18 week season um, for our main summer season. And then we are attending um, the, the Mill City Farmers Market in Minneapolis. We've been there uh, since that market started in 2006. And so this will be our 11th season there. It's been a fabulous market and we've, we've kind of grown with that market. Um, since the market started around the time that we started farming, uh, our business and our, uh, stall there and relationships with customers have kind of have grown together, which has worked out really well for our farm and it's become a, a great source of business. So we do about 35% of our sales are at our farmer's market stand and then we do about 5% wholesale. And um, that when we moved here in 2009, um, I believe we were around 125 actual CSA boxes that we were packing each week. So we have grown since then. And when we moved here, that that was our fifth year of Adam and I operating our business, operating Loon Organics. And I think we expected that, okay, we're in year five, we have our farm, we've gotten all of this, you know, machinery and equipment and supplies, we're really well set up. Um, we should be kind of out of that startup and growth period. Um, and what we realized was moving on to a new farm, you know, there was infrastructure that needed to be repaired and um customized to fit our use. And also we had to, we had to kind of regrow our business. We moved to a, a different geographic location, um, you know, and had scaled up quite a bit from what we were doing, um, at Gardens of Vegan. So it was definitely a growth period here until about 2012. And that's when I feel like we really stabilized. So it was about seven years total of farming, um, and I, and I thought that was going to come earlier, I have to say, um, but it, it did take about seven years for us to feel like we are, we are now at a point of stability. We're not in this growth period anymore. And it's great to be there. And I kind of feel like that has continued, um, you know, for, for the past couple years where we've kind of just been able to maintain the stability. And honestly, um, every year, every year that we have farmed, we have become better farmers. So um, we've had about the same amount of land that we've been farming here for the past um, three or four seasons. We have about eight acres that we cultivate annually in vegetables out of our 40. And we have an, about an additional four or five acres that we will have in cover crops. And then the, the farm has some other wetlands, some lower areas that aren't suitable for vegetable production, um, woods, some nice wildlife habitat. Um, but we're around eight acres of actual vegetables Vegetables, and then we have uh, 10,000 square feet of hoop house space. And um, we've been able to grow our gross sales every year, uh, just I think by farming a little bit smarter and really optimizing 
efficiency, improving our soils and productivity, uh, you know, just kind of maximizing the resources that we have here. Um, so we're curious of how, how far can we push this on what, what we have here, you know, and obviously the hoop houses help that as well, push that, that profit margin up. So how far are you interested in pushing it? I mean, is, is it something where you're, you're continuing to want to expand your sales or are you, are you hitting a point where you feel like we're in the groove, we're making enough money and, and that's good. All we need to do is keep up with inflation. Yeah. We're not really interested at this point in time in expanding uh, a lot of the volume that we're doing. We're not interested too much in expanding our CSA. We, you know, I think it's more of like, optimizing our markets. So, you know, making sure that everything that we can sell at our farmer's market that we are growing and that we have available. So we're not missing out on any sales opportunities there. Um, you know, and same thing with some of our wholesale accounts, you know, how can we kind of just best optimize this and fit this into our operation? Um, you know, I think the, we feel fine about what we are making as a family in terms of our salary, Um, I don't want to farm anymore. I don't want to work anymore. (laughs) That has been one of our goals um, since we have gotten to a little bit more of a stable point in our operation is is to say we want to farm, but we also want to have time for ourselves and time for our family and for our kids. Um, So I'm more interested in being able to continue to kind of push that and see you know, what, what can we produce on what we have? Um, you know, that allows us to compensate our employees and our staff, um, even better, which I think, um, helps us keep people around and keep really good quality people around. Um, and that, that's kind of where now I'm looking at, at how we can, you know, spread the love around and, and spread out some of that, um, increasing, increasing sales. Okay. So I know that is something that you've done in recent years as a way of Im- improving your business, if not expanding it, is that you've really worked at, at handing over responsibility to your employees, in, including, I think, bringing on somebody who with, with the job title of, of a farm manager recently. Exactly. So last year was the first year that we officially had a farm manager position um, that we advertised and and filled. And and that was new for us and, and kind of a jump for us to say, all right, we no longer, Adam and I, as the, the owners and farmers are at a point where we no longer can be responsible for, for everything on the farm. Um, and we really need someone to kind of take over and make sure that these details are taken care of, um, especially in, in regards to production and, um, you know, farmer's market and, and kind of the, the on-farm stuff there's, you know, as farmers know, there's an incredible amount of like behind the scenes work and office work. Um, Adam is our machinery and equipment guy. He has a lot of work in his shop, um, that he needs to take care of and kind of just basic facilities management. Um, and then I have, you know, the book work and newsletters and, emails and all of that stuff, which was happening after work in the evenings. Um, and that totally blows, you know, like you have no time then as like a couple and, um, with your kids, if you're stressed out about writing your newsletter for the next day. Um, so that was one of our goals was to be able to free up, um, time for both Adam and I to really focus on what we felt like we needed to do, um, and, and integrate that into our regular work day so that it wasn't, it wasn't an after hours thing. It wasn't something that I needed to be with our crew at all of the time. We had someone, um, who could take over some of that. Um, and that we've found some great people to do that. We raised our CSA prices and asked our members to pay a little bit more. Um, and we put all of those proceeds towards, um, that payroll expense of, of having a a manager at a higher, um, hourly pay rate. And people were really supportive of that. Thankfully, um, we have, you know, by that time we had 
a lot of members who have been with us for, you know, five plus years. And so they're pretty invested in our farm and and know our family well. Um, So they were happy to, um, you know, throw a few extra dollars our way for that purpose. Um, And yeah, and then it's just been a practice for us, which we're still practicing of of actually delegating and letting go. (laughs) Um, And, and that's hard as a, as a business owner, especially when you have been involved in all of those realms. Um, but it's great practice for us and, and really necessary. Um, especially this year, we have a new baby that was born just a few months ago, and then we have a four and a half year old, uh, son, Eli. So we have a lot of family stuff going on right now. And, um, both Adam and I are just not able to be as involved. Um, so it's a, it's a really good time for us to be delegating and, and practicing, um, you know, having some other people take that on. And for the most part, you know, that's what, what, that's what they want. You know, they need that experience if they want to go on and have their, their own farms. Um, or if we want to keep them around, they want to have more responsibility and they want to feel more, more ownership. Um, so I think it's a, you know, it's a win-win for everyone. What have you found to be important factors in your ability to delegate work and to really, I mean, you know, delegation and especially at a high level for somebody like a farm manager is it, you know, it's, it's one part being clear about what you want. And it's another part, I think, being clear about what you're willing to have as far as things be done differently, because nobody's going to do something exactly the way that you do it. Exactly. Yeah. I, I think that is sometimes the biggest struggle and that that's kind of the letting go process that I'm talking about. So the process of, of delegating has really been a process of letting go um, and letting go of, of some of that uh, responsibility and control, you know, where normally I will be working with our crew every day um, from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. Um, and that, you know, getting away from that, then I need to have that person be able to make um, decisions and calls and be okay with that. What has been helpful for me is to keep the big picture in mind. So I'm always thinking, you know, oh, they did that a little bit differently than I wanted to do or than I would have done in the big picture. You know, is that affecting anything? Um, is that affecting her profit? Is that going to affect production? Um, if I step back and ask myself that question, most of the time it is no, um, you know, this is just a different way of doing it. And, and so part of it is being really open to, to actually still learning about maybe there is a better way to do this. Um, and you know, I have to say, sometimes I'm surprised, um, pleasantly surprised at, at just like the simplicity or, um, the new approach that people will take. And, and I have learned, you know, last year I, I learned a lot from our farm manager, um, Andrew Lars, and I expect to also learn quite a bit from, um, Sophie, our manager this year, she's been on, on three really great farms. So, um, you know, that's part of the process I think of, of growing our business and saying, okay, I'm going to step back and let's see where this goes, keeping the really big picture in mind. Um, so kind of like the, the, the details of how we communicate, because a lot of it is, is really good communication and organization. And, and, uh, since I'm not able to be out with them very often right now with a newborn baby, we kind of have these check-ins throughout the day. So there will be an early morning check-in, usually like a late morning um, check-in before lunch, uh, after lunch check-in, and then sometimes again in the afternoon um, just to, you know, because things change, things don't go according to plan, um, especially at the beginning of the season when we're training people. Uh, and just honestly having as much communication as possible as we can. Um, we also have team meetings, um, a couple times this spring where we'll all just sit down, uh, and have a conversation about roles and responsibilities and delegation and how things are working, um, and kind of, kind of filling in our staff on, on the bigger picture and what we 
what we need from them. Um, so that has also been a really helpful thing, which we didn't quite realize that, you know, you, you're just like, there's so much work to be done. We just got to keep working. Um, and then taking a step back and, and having those meetings, um, makes a huge difference. You know, I think for everyone to just feel like, all right, we're on the same page here. We're all working towards the same goals. You know, it's, it's actually a, a principle that, that David Allen outlined in his book, getting things done, which I'm a huge fan of is this idea that when you're, you know, when you're overwhelmed with things to do, the best thing to do is to actually stop doing them, step back and get a bigger picture, kind of level up and go, okay, this is what's going on. Get some perspective and then dive back in, even though it's the most counterintuitive thing to do because you're exactly. always, especially on the farm, there's, you know, there's so many things to do. Yeah. Yeah. I was just going to say that's totally counterintuitive. Um, I think for, for farmers, cause we're just like, you just got to work harder and faster. You know, <laughs> if we're behind, then just like pick up the pace, you know, and push through, um, and, and that's, that's definitely a line of thinking that we in the past few years have said, you know what, like, let's, let's take a step back and, and try something else. And, you know, I will say we, um, you know, Adam and I came into farming when we were pretty young in our early twenties, we didn't have a ton of work experience or business background before that. Um, so I think we got to about 2011, 2012 and, had done what we could do and then kind of reached this point where we were like, yeah, we need to delegate. Like, yeah, we want to grow our business and we want to have more time for our family, but we're just like, we're, we don't know how to do that. Um, so we had a farmer's market customer who was also a business consultant and worked with businesses on kind of leadership and development. Um, and we brought her in, um, in 2012 to kind of help us just be a support system for like setting up some of these things that we needed on the farm so that we could step back. Um, you know, and that, that I think has been a huge source of support for us. Um, you know, especially just figuring out like this balance between our family and the farm. Um, cause really the farm is like a little kid. I mean, it could just like totally overtake your life if you let it. Um, and we were like, whoa, 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 like we got to take a step back, but how do we do that? Um, uh, so, so we have our consultant, Jan will help us facilitate some of these meetings, um, and, and just give us like this business perspective, which, you know, we don't, we don't have because we started when we were so young, which is awesome because now we've been farming for 11 years and we're in our mid thirties. Um, but I also feel like we did, you know, like you're missing some of that knowledge that you would get if you started this career a little bit later in life. Right. If you, if you did some other things first and developed that, yes. that career, um, yeah, I mean, then again, I mean, Mark Zuckerberg started Facebook right out of college and he's done fine too. So I think, I mean, I think you're good to go. <laughs> yeah. So far it's, <laughs> so far it has worked out. So <laughs> good analogy. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> All right. So with that, Laura, we're going to take a break, get a word from our sponsors, and then we'll be right back. The Farmer to Farmer podcast is made possible with the generous support of Vermont Compost Company, makers of Fort V and Fort Light potting mixes. Vermont Compost potting soils are a really special product. I used Vermont Compost Fort V as a blocking mix and potting soil for over 12 years on my farm, and we grew great transplants with it. And I mean really great transplants, year after year. At a time in the organic movement when we're seeing more and more companies jumping on the bandwagon, Vermont Compost is a reminder of the art and the craft of making potting soil. They mix an incredible diversity of ingredients into the compost that forms the basis of their potting soil, incorporating many kinds of manures along with plant materials and food wastes to foster structure and aeration in the compost. I love that they're Fort V mix even has chips of ocean blue granite in it and kelp for a little smell of the ocean. One thing I've always appreciated about Vermont Compost is their ability to put out a consistent product year after year. And in something that's subject to as many variables as market farming, it's nice to have something that you can count on. VermontCompost.com. 
This episode of the Farmer to Farmer podcast is brought to you by BCS America. BCS two-wheel tractors are often mistaken for just a rototiller, but it is truly a superior piece of farming equipment. Engineered and built in Italy where small farms are a way of life, BCS tractors are built to standards of quality and durability expected of real agricultural equipment, the kind of dependability that every farm needs. On my own farm, we went through a number of so-called solutions before we finally got smart and bought a BCS. Even though we owned a four-wheel tractor to manage our 20 acres of vegetables, That BCS tackled jobs that we couldn't do with the larger machine, from mowing steep slopes and around trees to working in our high tunnels. Whether you're looking for a rototiller, power harrow, rotary plow, flail mower, snow thrower, sickle bar mower, chipper, log splitter, or just about anything else, you can run it on a BCS. Check out bcsamerica.com to see photos and videos of BCS in action. It's pretty cool. bcsamerica.com. And we're back with Laura Frericks from Loon Organics in Hutchinson, Minnesota. Laura, we were just talking about uh, how you guys in in 2011, 2012 were kind of looking to upgrade the business processes on your farm. That's also, if if I've got my math right, that's about the same time that that Eli came along, your your four-year-old. Exactly. Yeah, Eli was born in the late summer of 2011. And in 2012 was was really when we said, wow, we need to figure out uh, a better way of, of doing things and how we can have a little bit more balance in our lives. Um, so I think, you know, having kids will bring any any, you know, problem or, or uh, issue that you're having um really bring it to the forefront, you know, and, and we needed to be able to step back a little bit, um, from our farm and just have more time, um, for, for ourselves and for our family, um, and, and really reconnect. So, um, that I, that wasn't a coincidence at all. Um, and, and it really spurred us to say, okay, like how can we treat this more as a job? We are established now. We're not in the startup phase where we need to be working 16 hour days. Um, so how can we step back and say, we're going to have, you know, an eight to five day, most days. Um, you know, if, you know, of course there's weather, there's, there's things that come up and we need to be flexible about that. But, um, in general, um, we wanted to have a little bit more separation between, you know, farm life and home life. And, um, it's still an ongoing process, but we've gotten way better about it. Um, you know, Sundays, we try to be no farm Sundays. So maybe we'll take a a farm walk or we'll take a little crop tour, but we try not to pick watermelons on Sunday. Um, (laughs) Right. It's been known to happen, but, <laughs> um, you know, we just try to set some limits on, on what we're willing to do for the business. Um, because like I mentioned earlier, I think it can just be like that, that kid that just kind of, or, or whatever, uh, you know, this entity that just kind of can take over everything because it will take everything that you give it. Um, you know, there's an unending amount of work that can be done on a farm. So at some point we have to call it good and be okay with that. Um, so having kids, I think allowed us to, to really step up and say, this is really important. We need to do this for our family. We need to do this for our business because we're not going to keep farming if we're burning ourselves out, we're not going to enjoy doing this and and we're not going to want to keep and continue to do this. Um, and yet we still really loved the work. So, it, you know, it's an evolution of, of figuring out, well, we're not going to do exactly the same thing for 30 years. Um, you know, we need to grow in and have some new things. Um, so that very much, you know, needed to bring in some people with experience who could help take some of that responsibility off of our plate. You know, we were talking about habits, uh, over, over the break on, you know, off, well, off the recording and, and I sometimes wonder if, if the, the, those 16 hour workdays are as much a habit as anything else, you know, that it's just, you know, when, when there's an empty spot, that's what you turn to rather than having it be something that's really intentional about, yeah, there's really 16 hours of work that absolutely has to be done before I can go in and, and sit down and have dinner with my partner. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, I think it's such a huge challenge for this profession is that most of us live where we work. And so you see that you see all those things, especially as you become more experienced, like you see all those tiny little things that could be done. Um, and if you, you know, most of us are really hardworking. Some of us have some, you know, type A personalities. And so like that bugs you. Um, <laughs> yeah. so, so yeah, I think there is very much of just like when, once you get started and you've been doing that, Um, as a beginner. And then you also see other farmers doing that as well. It's like, this is just what we have to do in terms of, you know, keeping the the business going. And, you know, we got to get every single weed out of our field and, you know, everything has to be exactly how we need it to be. And, um, you know, we did after seven years, it's like, no, that's just not going to be possible. So, so it is a uh, nice to have some experience to say, what are things that we can let slide? Um, again, like what's that big picture? What's gonna, you know, we want to have super high quality, beautiful produce, um, you know, among all of these other things. So how do we do that without killing ourselves and, you know, working these crazy hours? Could you share some examples of things that you've decided to let slide, you know, either as a policy decision or as just a, you know, from moment to moment as you're deciding what needs to be done during the day? Yeah, I, I think that, um, what it often, how it has played out is that we will take on less, um, like farm projects. So, you know, there's kind of with, we bought a farm that was a old dairy farm. So we have infrastructure here that, you know, constantly could be repaired. And, you know, there's always things that we can be improving um, and projects that we have on the docket. Like we'd love to expand our pack shed. We'd love to put up another hoop house. Um, We'd love to expand our greenhouse. Um, All of these things. And for a while, we were having these really large projects, you know, a couple really large projects that would kind of fall onto Adam's plate. Um, And we we would do that every like fall and spring. We would say, all right, now we're going to expand our pack shed. We're going to put in a bigger cooler. Um, We're going to upgrade this and this and this. Um, you know, and, and we've kind of learned to say, all right, like what is actually necessary? Can we get by another year so that we don't have, you know, five of these projects that we need to do, which we know from past experience is going to be super stressful. Um, and, and then how can we be strategic about that? Or how can we be creative about thinking about this this problem, like not having enough space, like, can we do some washing in our greenhouse in the fall, which would free up some room in our pack shed? Um, you know, things like that. I think it's forced us to just be a little bit more creative. Um, in terms of day-to-day work, I think that it has been a little bit less about like the details as in this needs to be done exactly like this. Um, more of like these overall goals, like for the day to day, this needs to get seeded. This needs to be transplanted. Um, this needs to be weeded. This needs to be harvested. Um, and this is the time period that we have to do this. Um, and last, like, let's talk about every single detail, you know, that's involved with this. Um, if that makes sense. So just trying to be a little bit more efficient, um, about how we're, we're going about our task. You mentioned a couple of times as, as you were talking about about prioritizing their, the importance of putting out top quality vegetables. And, and that's something that you guys are known for is having really good stuff uh, that's going to market, that's going out in your CSA shares. Can you tell us a little bit about how you ensure that you have great product going out the door? Yeah, I would say that that is one of our number one um, production goals is is to have really high quality, super clean produce. Um, We spend a lot of time building our soil. One of the main reasons that we were really excited about this farm that we moved to was that it had really incredible um, prairie soil here. So just, you know, black, super rich, high organic matter. Um, 
but you can grow some really great vegetables, really beautiful vegetables. And we've done a lot of soil building work since we moved here. And immediately, I mean, it was a, it was a big expense when we moved here. And I remember, um, one of our mentors telling us, you know, like it's worth it, like invest in that, invest in cover cropping, invest in compost and manure you, it will pay dividends and it, and it totally has. And it's kind of amazing how quickly, um, we've been able to just see results from that. So we've been pretty intensive about, about building our soils, um, and finding a cover cropping strategy that works for us and for our soils. Um, and I think, you know, for us, we of course do soil testing and and kind of monitor things, but the real, indicator for us is the quality of our produce. Um, and that just has continued, um, you know, to be really our biggest goal here. Um, and, and luckily I feel like we have, we have the knowledge and we have the production skills, um, to know how to grow really nice produce. Um, part of the time that we were at Gardens of Egan, we focused on growing a lot of uh, crops that they did not grow because we felt like we had a really good grasp of how to produce awesome broccoli and kale um, and sweet corn, for example, but we didn't have any experience growing carrots. So when we were incubating there, we grew a lot of carrots and we let them grow the broccoli. So when we came to our farm, um, we were lucky to have kind of both of those experiences to to know how to grow um, 50 different crops and, and grow them all, you know, pretty well. Um, not, not always we've dropped a few crops here and there, but, um, you know, first and foremost, if we have good soil, um, we know the production that we can then produce really nice, high quality produce. I know you guys also place an an emphasis on post-harvest handling. Very much so. Yeah. And, and I, I think that of course, you know, as you know, it's so important for, for quality and really what makes our produce stand out sometimes. Um, cause lots of other farms have great soil. Um, to me, when I look at their produce, the, the only difference I see is probably in our post-harvest handling techniques. So we're really conscious. We do training with our staff, um, from the get go on just the whole cold chain. And, um, we're pretty, uh, perfectionistic about getting things, you know, out of the field and keeping them as cold as possible for those, those crops that need that, um, to really maintain that, that quality. And, and along with the, the cooling is, is to get things really clean. Um, and we hear from our customers over and over how much they appreciate that. Um, and it's a little bit more work for us on our end, but, but, you know, if you're growing beautiful, nutritious, wonderful produce, you know, let people see that, <laughs> get the mud off and let them see that. Um, so that has been, you know, another kind of key part of, uh, I think, of our marketing is to make sure everything is super clean. What kind of tools are you using for cleaning your produce? We have a brush washer. We also use a pressure washer for a lot of our root crops. Um, we're going to purchase a barrel washer this year. I'm excited about that. We've had challenges with carrots, so I'm excited about a barrel washer for carrots. Uh, and then we have, you know, big 50 gallon tubs, um, for dunking and cleaning and cooling a lot of spray tables and just spray nozzles, um, that will, that will clean things off. Um, I'm a big proponent of, as much as possible, harvesting things and keeping them clean. So we have to do less washing and cleaning in the pack shed. What are some examples about how you do that out in the field? When we're cutting, um, I'm thinking of brassicas, for example. Um, You know, that's something where I never want that product to be touching the ground, um, to be in contact with the soil if possible. So I want us to be cutting the broccoli with a clean knife. Um, so keeping the stem end clean, um, stripping the leaves either with our knife or with our hands, it goes into a clean tote with either, um, like a wax paper or clean broccoli leaves on the bottom of that tote. And oftentimes now what we're doing, um, we're too small to get a veggie veyer, like a harvesting, uh, you know, 
uh, one of those belts that moves through the field yeah. where people put the produce on it and it moves it over to the field road. Yeah, exactly. I would love to have one of those, but um, we use a lot of golf carts on our farm. So we'll set our fields up so we can be driving either in the field roads or pretty close to our crop and have our totes on the back of the golf cart. So they're up off the ground. And so then all of our product is going into clean totes on the back of the golf cart. So they're not getting exposed to, you know, dirt and soil from the, from the field that's on the tote that we're putting clean produce into. Um, so, you know, things like broccoli, cauliflower, kale, um, you know, that should never have dirt on it unless, you know, whatever, unless you drop it or, or it's been super muddy or something. But for the most part, if you're cleaning with a clean knife, um, and keeping things clean, you can get it so that it's really just a cooling process then that we have to do when we get back to the pack shed, um, root vegetables with a heavy clay soil is where we're having to do a lot more cleaning. Same thing with um, tomatoes and summer squash and cucumbers. We're picking with white cotton cloth gloves that are clean. Um, So we can kind of, as we're picking tomatoes, we can kind of polish the tomatoes as we're picking them. The tomatoes go into clean one layer tomato trays that are on a a rack, um, sorry, that are on a, um, a little harvest wagon or on a golf cart. Um, so, you know, the tomatoes are something that we're not washing, but they're really clean. Um, you know, we're trellising the tomatoes, they're up off the ground. Uh, and, and yeah, it's something that, that we're known for, um, that, that people comment on. And I think especially for a farmer's market, uh, people are buying with their eyes, you know, and they, whether or not they are consciously deciding to buy produce because it's cleaner, they see that beautiful produce and it just, you know, it's like brings them in. It like sucks them in (laughs) and they want to take pictures of it. And, um, you know, they want to, they want to eat it. So it's, it's to our advantage as well. So Laura, I mean, we, just talking about how the farmer's market makes, you know, is, is this place where you really are advertising your business, but you guys are also running a CSA as a fairly major portion of your, well, not even as a fairly major portion. You guys are running a CSA as a, as the cornerstone of your business with 60% of your sales going there, but you're in one of the most crowded CSA markets in the country. And I know a lot of folks in, in the twin cities have been complaining about how the CSA market is full. How are you guys dealing with that? It's a great question, Chris. Uh, We have definitely noticed there is just a plethora of CSA farms now that are marketing in and around the Twin Cities. And it's wonderful. Um, It's wonderful to see that we just have, you know, so many new farmers who are getting into it. But I think it's also become super competitive. Um, I'm grateful we've had a a wonderful group of, of kind of core members who have been with us for several years, many years, five to seven years. And we find that they are our biggest cheerleaders. So through word of mouth, um, through getting their, their friends and their neighbors and their family members to be a part of our farm. Um, we've kind of grown this, this, very strong community where I think we have about a 75% retention rate. Um, it does vary from year to year. Um, one of the most interesting things that we noticed is we, for many years had a CSA pickup site at our farmer's market stand. And so we saw those members every week, um, had a pretty strong relationship with each one of those members. And, they would not drop out. Um, You know, we had such a long waiting list for our farmer's market pickup site because no one would drop out unless they had to move across the country or something. They would buy, gosh, they were going to, you know, stay in our CSA. They loved us. You know, we became friends with a lot of them. Um, We get together with them outside of, of the farm and CSA events. So that one-on-one connection and, and CSA is really relationship building. So it takes time. It's 
similar to a farmer's market stand where now that we have been at the same farmer's market for 10 years, we have customers who have been shopping with us for that long. We've seen their kids grow up. Um, we've seen divorces. We've seen marriages. We've kind of seen the whole gamut of what has gone on in people's lives. And they have seen the same as well in our lives. So that, you know, is really the heart of direct marketing is that, that, that relationship building. Um, so for us to have a core group of members to kind of really, you know, get, get their friends and family involved and find people that are a good fit for our farm, uh, as well as having a farmer's market stand where we are able to advertise. We get some wonderful publicity there. Um, that's kind of an intangible, you know, advertising. We can never even buy, um, that kind of publicity that we get, um, from, from being there and from being a public, public face there. Um, but yeah, it really does come down to relationships. And we try to cultivate that even for members who aren't able to come out to the farm through a pretty detailed newsletter, um, you know, keeping them up to date throughout the throughout the season and in the off season about what's going on at the farm um, and, and really being pretty open about, you know, our family and um, and our staff and making it really personal. Um, I had one member who um, left us for a couple years just because one of our drop sites wasn't convenient for her. And she came back after a few years and she said, you know why I came back? I had a CSA. The produce was just fine, but I missed your newsletter. And that's why I came back to you. <laughs> so, wow. I, that's yeah, I was amazed. And, you know, I was like, great, people are reading it. You know, not everyone does, but the people who do really appreciate it. Um, and it just helps to build that build that connection with people. And just to, to dig into the nitty gritty a little bit, how are you guys distributing the newsletter? Is that going out over email, printed in the box, sitting there at the drop site? How's that structured? Yep. So we send it out through MailChimp to everyone um, online um, before they pick up their box, usually. Like our goal is to do it the night before um, for people so they know what's going to be in their box. But they also get a paper copy in their box. And I would love to get away from printing, you know, 175 um, two page newsletters every week, but people love the paper. They put them in binders. They keep them for years, you know, cause they have a lot of recipes on them. And, um, I just, you know, there, there's something really tangible about that paper. Um, so for now we're, we're sticking with that, the paper and the, the online format as well. Okay. And you're, you're putting it right in the box. Yep. It's just folded like right underneath, you know, the flap of the box. How is the newsletter organized? What what information are you putting into it? Do you kind of have a standard template that you're using every week? Yes, we do have a standard template. Um, it consists of letting people know what's in the boxes, um, first and foremost, and giving them some information about that. Anything, we strive to have about 10 to 15 different items in our box. Um, I will say that's another... I think an advantage of our CSA is we include a lot of variety in our weekly boxes. Um, so that has been something that has distinguished us from some other farms that will maybe focus more on five or seven items, but they will give you more. Um, we do quite a bit of variety. So we try to have pretty standard items, but always there's one or two things that might be a little bit less well known. So we'll We'll highlight that. We'll maybe include a picture, give people information about what it is and how to cook it. Um, and then there's some news from the farm. So usually a paragraph or two that I'm writing or a staff person is writing just to let them know, um, you know, what's what's going on at the farm this week and what happened and any funny stories or any notable things. Um, and then we have the whole back page is like a recipe and food um, ideas corner so that we're giving people a lot of really easy to use recipes, things that we've been cooking that we've been really enjoying, um, you know, tips and tricks. 
I also give people storage information. That's kind of like taking post-harvest handling that next step so that people know how to handle things when they get the box. Um, like don't put basil in your fridge. That's it's going to turn black. Um, so being really clear about what needs to be stored where and how to store that. Uh, and, um, and then giving people a preview of what's going to be in the box next week. Cause you know, I think that can be the challenge of CSAs for, especially for people who are planners is they kind of want to know what, what, what is my week meal going to look like next week? Um, so we try to give them a preview of here are, you know, at least eight to 10 things that we know will probably be in the box next week to give them that idea. And how much time do you spend on that newsletter every week? At this point, um, I can crank it out pretty fast. Usually I would give probably say about two hours. Um, I'm also delegating some of the newsletter recipes and writing out to staff members now, and they can do it faster than I can. I tend to spend a lot of time, you know, making sure things are exactly how I want them to be. Um, whereas they're a little bit less, you know, invested. It's more of just like, I have this task to do. Um, so they can, they can do it, you know, in 90 minutes or an hour. Um, whereas it takes me a little bit longer. With that, Laura, I'd like to turn to the lightning round. Uh, you know, ask you some, uh, a quick round of questions here. What's your favorite tool on the farm? My favorite tool is, we have an electric fleet here on the farm. Um, we have electric golf carts and we have electric tractors. That is Adam's forte. He's converted uh, four tractors now to be electric powered. And they're definitely my favorite tool. I love transplanting behind a quiet electric tractor. Um, no loud screaming over motors, no yelling at the drivers. Um, we can listen to music while we're transplanting. <laughs> um, and we can go really, really, really slow if we need to. Uh, so, you know, the, the electric golf carts are, we have four of those and they're just indispensable for us. They are our harvest carts. Um, we use them to get all around the farm. And for the most part, you know, we're a small farm. We don't need usually to be transporting thousands of pounds of produce around the farm. If we do, we'll, we'll grab a tractor and a wagon. Um, but normally, you know, it's, it's transporting, um, you know, 50 pounds of greens or, a uh, hundred heads of broccoli or something. And that can totally be done on a golf cart. Um, so it's quiet. We're not using gasoline. Um, they're quick and they're really fun. They're really fun to drive. Same with the electric tractors. People just love driving them. They're easy to use. Um, you know, you just plug it in after, after you're finished with it. So, um, it's kind of, um, you know, it makes everything, everything easier for us and quiet. I appreciate that it's quiet. So what kinds of tractors has Adam converted to electric? I mean, I, I know the G, I mean, that's kind of the standard conversion, Yeah. but it sounds like maybe you've got more than that. We do. And actually he, what's funny is he has actually never done a, an Alice G. Um, he did his first one was a hefty G, which is kind of a knockoff of that, um, of the Alice G. Uh, so that was our first one. Uh, and then he did, uh, a, a cock shut. Um, the awesome thing about converting tractors to electric is he's been able to, to get some tractors that have had, um, regular gasoline motors that don't work anymore. You know, they've blown up They're they're non-functional. Um, so he can get some tractors for a steel, um, and then convert it to electric, you know, where he takes out the motor anyways. So you don't need that component to be working. Um, so we have the Cockshut. That's probably our nicest electric tractor that has more power. Um, we're using that now um, for transplanting. So we have a, um, a homemade transplanter that Adam made that um, that electric tractor can pull uh, and can also do some light tillage. And then last year he converted a, a case offset tractor. And again, that tractor normally would be, you know, a ten to twelve thousand dollar tractor and, and it had a blown motor. So he got it for a few thousand dollars, converted that, and we used that for um spraying and um 
laying rime and, and plastic mulch laying. Um, we're going to plant onions with that tomorrow. So uh, a number of tractors now. And so these are smaller tractors. You know, we still have diesel 80 to 100 horsepower tractors for some of our major tillage. But for smaller cultivating, um, pulling wagons around, pulling, you know, light transplanters, the electric conversion is really nice um, for some of those lighter duty jobs on the farm. The other awesome thing about electric tractors and farming with kids is that you can have your four-year-old sit on your lap while you're driving the transplanter and they don't have to wear ear protection. Uh, and they can just, you know, hang out on the electric tractor. You can basket weed, you can go, you know, plant a row. And if you can get your four-year-old to sit on your lap <laughs> for 15 minutes, you know, who needs a babysitter? <laughs> this is not something that's to be underestimated in, in its in its sheer power for farm efficiency. <laughs> it's true. Yeah. So, and I guess we could, you know, like, you know, strap on a car seat and put, put Willie the newborn on there. That may happen this year. <laughs> And you said you like to listen to music while you're transplanting. What's the best music for transplanting? <laughs> oh, that's a good question. You know, we listened to a lot. Of, we listened last year to a lot of Charlie Parr. He's a kind of a blues folk guy um, from Minnesota that just everyone on the farm loved. So we would listen to him and, you know, kind of gritty, um, which is appropriate. Um, we love to listen <laughs> to Stevie Wonder. When we pack CSA boxes, we listen to Stevie Wonder's greatest hits. Um, and that that has been super inspiring. Although I think it might be time. It's been a couple of years we've listened to CV, so it might be time to switch that up. <laughs> I love that. Stevie Wonder's greatest hits. Okay. Um, all right. And what's your favorite crop to grow? My favorite crop to grow hands down is broccoli. Um, I just love everything about it. The We've got a great system. Um, it's transplanted. We can cultivate it and side dress it. Usually we don't have to hoe or hand weed our broccoli. It's a great crop to put in a field that we have some perennial weeds like quack grass in because we're just going to be cultivating that crop a few times and we can keep it really clean. Um, so it's a, a great crop to help like clean up a field. And then we grow great broccoli on our farm. Um, just huge heads. They're beautiful. It's super delicious. Um, it's a favorite crop of our CSA customers and our market customers. So it's like, it's got everything going for it. <laughs> Are you doing broccoli all summer long? Because yeah. that's not an easy thing to do. Yeah, actually, we seed broccoli in our um, greenhouse every week of the summer. So we do like I think 17 plantings, succession plantings of broccoli. Um, I think we're on, we're seeding number five, um, succession number five today. And we found a few varieties that do do really well um, through the summer. And, and again, like, you know, just having, having really nice broccoli in the summer. I mean, people, people love that. Um, and that's, we can sell, you know, definitely a couple hundred pounds of, really nice summer broccoli at our farmer's market stand. And people are happy to have a couple big heads in their CSA box. I've never heard complaints of too much broccoli. Everybody knows what to do with broccoli. I mean, when I first moved out of my parents' house and had to cook on my own, I knew how to cook broccoli and I ate a lot of broccoli. Yeah. Yeah, I know. It's, it's easy, you know, it's, it's, it's easy to cook with. And and, um, you know, and like kids love our broccoli. And so their parents are like, my kid will eat your broccoli. It's amazing. You know? And I'm like, yeah, cause like broccoli that you grow that on a farm that in great soil, it tastes really good. It's sweet. Um, you know, and you can eat the stem. So, uh, yeah, we, we love growing broccoli. Um, I think if we just could grow only broccoli, um, we might consider that, you know, it would not be a great rotation, but, but it's such a fun and easy crop for us to grow and fast to harvest, like the benefits just go on and on. I love it. And what's the secret to growing great broccoli in the summertime? I mean, in, in Minnesota, I mean, it gets hot. It does get hot. So um, we definitely grow a couple uh, heat tolerant varieties, and that is really important. Um, and then timing. Uh, we're just making sure that uh, it's always getting side dressed. 
with a round of Sustain, which is a granulated uh, turkey fertilizer. So it's it's getting um, some great nutrients right when it needs it. We're making sure that we're irrigating, um, you know, right when the broccoli is starting to, the head of the broccoli is starting to cup. Um, and then we're harvesting, we're monitoring it and harvesting it, you know, usually every, at least every day. And if it's going to be like a 90 or 100 degree day, that broccoli grows so fast. Sometimes, you know, we'll do even like a early morning and, and, you know, come back and even check that broccoli at the end of the day, if we really don't want to miss it. Um, but for sure, pretty much a daily harvest, um, for, for summer broccoli. That's really intensive management. Yeah, I guess it is, but you know, it's so it's fast to harvest. Um, so you know, we can just buzz out there with our golf cart and like walk the, you know, walk the couple rows that are coming in and, and it's fast. Um, and, and then it's worth it, you know, just to, for, for us, since we're on limited land, we have to make sure that we are, um, really capturing as much good quality produce as we can and that we're marketing that because we have a market for it. Um, and that's, I think one of the keys, as I mentioned earlier, of like how to, how our gross sales have continued to grow on a limited amount of land is, is we are really maximizing our production, which means we got to get that product when it's at its peak quality. You know, it's something I should have asked you earlier, Laura, what, what are your gross sales on your eight acres of produce? Um, we are right around $200,000, um, uh, for last year. Um, so that was actually our goal. We were like, can we get to $200,000 on eight acres, um, with a couple hoop houses? Um, cause we basically kind of been at that same scale and just adding, you know, 10 or $15,000 in gross sales, um, every year. And so we're kind of excited to see what, what we can push that to, you know, on, on the same amount of land. That's great. And you mentioned the importance of, of recipes and talking about the things that you're actually cooking in your kitchen with your CSA members. What's your favorite thing to make with something that came from your farm? You know, in the summer, we don't have a, a ton of time to cook. It's a lot of like burritos and, and steamed veggies and salads. In the fall is when I'm happy for the the kind of the fall slowdown and to get back in the kitchen and really, you know, turn the oven on and do some cooking. Um, I, I love, I love the nightshade family. I love tomatoes and eggplants and, and, um, you know, basil and potatoes. And, um, so I, I love to, um, you know, make Italian food, um, whether it's baked eggplant or eggplant lasagna, um, ratatouille, you know, that's what I'm really looking forward to right now. We're, we're getting the first greens of the season and that's always really lovely, but like those meaty vegetables, um, like with that, that umami flavor, like I just, I just crave that. So I'm looking forward to that. Okay. Now I'm hungry. I know me too. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> if you could go and, and, and finally, Laura, if you could go back in time and tell your beginning farmer self one thing, what would it be? My advice would be to, to myself and to Adam, um, you know, and I think more to myself is, is use wheels to your advantage. (laughs) 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 Um, you know, I, I did a lot of, I, I, I love being outside. I love being, you know, out in the field and, and gardening. And I, I would love to just like be outside, pick flowers into a five gallon bucket, you know, and I would just carry that bucket back to our cooler. Um, I just carried a lot of things. And, um, now, you know, 12 years later, I'm like, wow, like my body is not, I'm not in my early twenties anymore. Um, you know, farming is hard on your body. So, um, I, I would just tell myself, you know, like, Laura, you're not always going to be this young. Your back isn't going to be this strong. Like, take care of it now <laughs> um, and, and use wheels, use carts, um, get a golf cart and uh, don't carry so many things and walk. <laughs> we actually tell people on our farm, um, our employees now, um, we tell them there's no reason to walk on our farm. Like, I don't want to see you walking out to the field. Like, we have golf carts for a reason. Um, 
Um, you know, so it's an efficiency standpoint, but it's also just like, we got to take care of our bodies if we want to keep doing this for, for the next couple decades. Great. Thank you so much for being on the podcast, Laura and, and happy birthday. <sighs> Thank you so much, Chris. Yeah. It was such a fun, um, fun thing to do on my birthday. So thank you so much for inviting me. I'm, I'm truly honored. All right. So wrapping things up here, I'll say again that this is episode 64 of the Farmer to Farmer podcast. And you can find the notes for this show at farmer to farmer podcast.com by looking on the episodes page or just searching for Frerix. That's F R E R I C H S. If you enjoy the podcast, I'll bet you'd enjoy keeping in touch through my email newsletter, The Flying Rutabaga. You can check that out at farmer to farmer podcast.com or purplepitchfork.com. Also, please head on over to iTunes, leave us a review if you enjoy the show, or talk to us in the show notes, or tell your friends on Facebook. We're at Purple Pitchfork on the book. Your reviews and referrals make a huge difference in our ability to reach out to a growing circle of listeners. Also, I appreciate so much all of the guest suggestions I received through the contact form on farmer to farmer podcastcom Please let me know who you would like to hear from. I'll do my best to get them on the show. Thank you for listening. Be safe out there and keep the tractor running. Mm-hmm.